Welcome, welcome, welcome everybody to Real Talk with Antoine D. Thurston, where we talk about real issues with real people and we have real conversations. I'm excited, I'm excited, so excited about this podcast, this Real Talk, what we're doing on this show, um, helping each other out. That's what it's all about. Waiting for my co-host, my guest, and my friend to come on. They're having a few technical difficulties. Hey, how you doing, Mr. Greg? How you doing? Right. Hallelujah. Praise God. <laughs> uh, yes, sir. I, I was calling on, I was calling on Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I was calling on Jesus. Here. Lord, hard like at the altar. <laughs> <laughs> Call on him. Yes, yes, yes. Man, I guess when you're really trying to do something constructive and productive, the enemy don't really want you to push forward. If it's some foolishness, he'll let it slide. You know, but right, exactly, I'm, absolutely. But man, I'm glad to have you. I'm glad to have you. It's it's a privilege you for you to be on here. We connected before um, through these type of uh, situations and, and and opportunities and events. But welcome to Real Talk with Antoine D. Thurston, um, entrepreneur, author, minister, elder, uh, and a, and a mentor as well at Parkway Middle. And this is where we are, just to have real conversations with real people about real issues. And I'm definitely thankful to have you as a guest on my show. And as a friend, I thank you. Um, could you do us a favor and just tell us a little bit about yourself, Elder um, Gerald Smith? So uh, my name is Gerald Smith. I am an elder in the Lord's Church. I'm also a, uh, the founder of Sound Mind Coaching and Consulting, LLC where I am a certified a life coach, certified counselor, and certified business consultant, where I help not just Christians, but also non-Christians as well. I'm an author of two books. Uh, my first book uh, came out in 2018, a, a Position to Prosper, Serving in the Kingdom. Uh, and then my second book came out last year, January of 2020, and that was Framing Your World Against All Odds. I'm a mentor, I'm a teacher, uh, I do a little bit of everything. Uh, I'm the founder of, excuse me, Life360 Small Group. Uh, we meet twice a month here in Charlotte, North Carolina. We're doing that via Zoom as well. Uh, mm. So I, I am busy. <laughs> yeah, you're busy, man. You're busy, B. <laughs> wow. Well, that's, that's, a, that's, that's, a, that's a resume. That'll get you in the White House right there. <laughs> yes sir but man, I, I love what you're doing man and so i want to ask you what made you pursue um life coaching what made you pursue life coaching for me i have always uh and this kind of this actually is tied into life coaching and then counseling as well 
Um, mm -hmm. I've always wanted to know why people do what they do. Okay. I have always wanted to know that. Um, that's always been in my mind. Um, and then I've always wanted to be able to help people overcome struggles and hurdles and challenges and to be able to encourage people to accomplish their goals. And that's something that I've always had within me. I didn't always embrace that, but it was always there. Okay. And the same reason why is for uh, counseling as well, right? Same. Yes. Same. Yes. Same. Okay. Um, so, you know, why should a person, why, why go, why should a person want a life coach? What is the purpose of having a life coach? Well, I'll say this. Um, I believe a person, there's a difference. And I believe people get life coaching mixed up with counseling. Life coaching helps you to move forward to attain a specific goal. Counseling helps you to overcome issues and hurdles of the past. And so a lot of times people try to use those terms um, as if they're the same and they're not. Um, and so for me, with life coaching specifically, it is helping people to get to a place where they can accomplish a specific goal that they have set in their life or to be able to achieve a certain level of success by bringing someone in to hold them accountable to be able to get to where they need to be. I, I'm more of a coach that's on the sideline. Coaches don't get out there and play, but they're on the sideline. If it's football, they're coaching you from the sideline and you know what plays, you know what you have to do, but they can't do it for you. You actually have to get out there and play yourself. And so that's that's my stand uh, with, with life coaching. Wow, that's amazing. Uh, you know, so I wanna ask, does a life coach have to be um, at that place, at that level, um, in order to help his clients, like at a certain level of success, uh, or a certain level, uh, or just success, or uh, in their life, do they have to be at a certain level in order to be a life coach? You know, this is my personal opinion. I'll say no, you, you don't. One thing I will say, you you do have, you should have the hunger to and desire to be able to help people to become better. I'm mm -hmm. also big on making sure that you have the tools to be able to help people overcome. With life coaching, you, you really, you really, you're coaching not just through what you know as far as education, but you're also coaching from experience and some of the things you've been through. Life coaching is so broad. Um, you can cover so many things from ethics and risk coaching to um, you can coach as far as divorce coaching, singles coaching, financial coaching. It is very broad. And so what I tell people is you have to learn to find your niche. But in order to find your niche, you have to know your purpose. And then you have to know exactly what you, um, what you have endured in life. How can you use that to help better someone else's life and to help them make it to the next level? That's powerful. That's good. Because I remember um, I was thinking about that because I'm actually going to be eventually um, within the next couple of months certified as a life coach, um, certified yes. in your management and family counseling. And we spoke about yes. the difference between a life coach um, and a counselor. Yes. Um, and, and a counselor focuses more on the past to get you to overcome it, but a life coach just coaches right. you to the future to reach your goals. And right. so you know, I'm pursuing that, and I definitely want to specialize in becoming a mental health um, life coach for those that because I've overcame my struggles, I overcame depression, I overcame suicidal thoughts, I overcame um, anxiety, worry, and not just even pre salvation, but even post salvation. I had to um, renew my mind when it came to worry, um, anxiety, you know, worrying about this and then worrying about that. So you still got everyday life you, you can worry about. And so, right. you got Christians, right. and like you say, non Christians that don't know how to deal with those things, but if you can. Um, give some um, basic, simple application or strategies to overcome it, it can help. And, you know, while we're talking about life coaching, you know, it made me think about, uh, I used to play PlayStation 2 back in the day, back in 07 when it was hot. Um, yes, sir. We had this particular game called God of War that I used mm -hmm. to love playing. And it's a very, some of the games are really strategic and you got to think your way through it. Um, right. And with one part of God of War, um, I couldn't get past a certain level. I just kept dying and kept dying and kept dying. And I'm trying to, man, I'm getting beat up. And I don't know what to do. I keep, I know how to maneuver, but I kept getting stuck, kept getting right. stuck. And I had another friend that played the same game and he beat it. He said, man, I'm going to beat all that. I'm going to do all that. 
And man, he said, I, I told him about my situation. He said, man, I'm trying to get past this level, I'm trying to go to the next level and get, go further on. And he says, man, this is what you do. I've been there. You go here, 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 and then you're going to go here. And so I, I, I took the information. I applied it. And the next thing you know, I'm like, oh, my goodness. If I would not have had that conversation with my friend, I would have stayed at that same level Absolutely. for I don't know how long. And so, you Absolutely. know, we God gives us people, leadership, life coaches, counselors, and some of us were stuck. And some of us were stuck, not because we want to be stuck like I was in that game. I was stuck. I was trying to move forward. And sometimes it's hard to move forward when you don't know what to do. Like I was in a game. I didn't know how to get to the next level. I didn't know there was a rock I had to go past. I didn't know there was a butt. I didn't know. So sometimes, like you, like you say, um, from your experience, you're a life coach, you're a counselor. You, you get the tools and you show people how to get to that next level and to move forward. Sometimes people just don't have the help. Sometimes people don't have the resources. And so as a life coach, that's what you're, you're doing with, with what you have by myself as well, offering information. But the thing about it, even though he gave me the information, I still had to take it, trust him. I had to trust my friend enough to know that he's talking what he's talking about. And so if someone is successful in a certain area, we have to be open and mindful of that person of their expertise, of their experience, of their wisdom, and take it. And when we start to apply it to our life, we'll see ourselves going to that next level like we should. And sometimes people get information, but they don't apply it, but they're they're still at level one when God is trying to take you to level two. But you're listening, watch this, to level one people that have never even been to level two. So I can't take advice for someone that hasn't beat the game. You know, it's yeah. you know, this is the crazy thing about beating the game. Once you beat the game, you know how to do it over and over again. <laughs> and so it's good to find people that have beat the game in finances, yes. beat the game in, in overcoming suicidal thoughts, beat the game in, in debt cancellation, beat the game in, in, in paying off the student loans, beat the game in all these other areas. And so we have professionals and people that are licensed and certified and have yeah. over just overcome, like you said, with our experiences. And we have to be open and mindful to listen to those individuals. And I, I think it's great what you're doing. And you're helping people because you beat the game. And, you know, uh, when they come out with we beat one game, they come out with the second, the sequel. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we gotta beat that. <laughs> but I, I admire what you're doing, and I love the wisdom that you give. And I, I know that you purchased my book, and I wanted to get your perspective on my book, but I want to talk about something else, mental health. Um, prior to becoming a counselor, what was your view on mental health and mental illness? Um, well, you know, before becoming a counselor, it was something that um, was taboo, like you weren't really, nobody really talked about it, or if you heard someone, you know, um, went to an institute for a living or somewhere, you know, it was always something that had such a negative, um, a negative flair to it. Like people would always feel like, oh no, well, you know, that means you're crazy, or that means something is wrong with you. Um, you know, so I, you know, now that I look back, even growing up, I can see where some people actually had some challenges, um, but, you know, we didn't have what we have now, you know, mental health hadn't progressed. So, um, you know, it, some of the things kind of went under the radar, but, you know, it was, it was one of those things that it just wasn't really talked about. It wasn't talked about in the community. You didn't mm -hmm. see much about it on TV. Um, you know, it was just one of those things that was almost, again, taboo, very hush-hush. Uh, and, and, and people were having, you know, nervous breakdowns, things of that nature, and whatever the case may be, um, mm -hmm. you know, but you really didn't hear about it too much. It wasn't in the forefront. So um, I'm grateful that we're starting to hear more about it now um, and that, you know, they're trying to remove the stigma from, you know, mental illness, you know, and, 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 and again, mental health, you know, and that's something that, you know, uh, I'll probably address that later, but I don't want to get ahead of myself. But it's just one of those things where I think, you know, we, we're shedding more light on it now and it's important. And, and I'm glad that you said, you know, said what you said, because um, when you deal with mental health, we, we do sweep it under the rug. I had learned even after um, writing my book or prior to writing my book while I was, in, while I was doing my business, I would go to mental health seminars by a friend of mine named Matt. And he was just educated about mental health. He's a born again believer. He's a pastor now. And he was just giving basic, simple information about just staying healthy in our mind. And when I learned that you can, you can go through just be, being verbally abused 
could cause post-traumatic stress disorder or depression or chronic depression. And I'm like, wow. And then I'm, sometimes you're only thinking the people that get post-traumatic stress disorder is if they go to Iraq or in the military, but you got people over here that in, are in their own war with someone that they live with or someone or growing up in a war zone. And so they're fidgeting and they're having these, these panic attacks and it even can cause, cause anxiety and panic attacks. And so, Absolutely. you know, just verbal abuse, not even hitting an individual um, or depression or grief and, and trauma and all that's trauma. And so, uh, you know, just learning that, that educational side is not just gunshots, but just the verbal abuse of, right. uh, and the, the slashing of words can cause someone to have a nervous yes. breakdown yes. Um, and so forth. Uh, but I, I think that's very profound. And, was, and, it, and it opened my mind. It opened my mind and helped me to be more sympathetic with individuals Absolutely. that have uh, been verbally abused. And, and then I even have a friend of mine that's a Christian psychologist. Um, and mm -hmm. just learning from her and gleaming from her, you know, right. uh, when you grow up in a certain environment, you become that environment. Yes, you, you do. Know, you become that environment. I remember there's a sure. woman I know personally. Um, she never cussed or used to curse growing up, brought up in a Christian home. She married a, a good man, you know, but he ended up kind of going astray. But he used to verbally abuse her very badly. And the only way she could escape was or get peace was to start cursing him out. Mm -hmm. And that's the only way. So she began to curse and mm -hmm. so forth. And, and she would say, that was my only escape. I had to become my oppressor. You know, sometimes we become our environment because we don't know how to deal with what we're going through. And sometimes there is no way to escape. Sometimes we feel like the only way is to become like the attacker, to become the molester, to become the liar, to become the adulterer, to become the enemy that's attacking us. And so we become, you know, what's oppressing us. And then therefore we become an oppressor ourselves. And this is not something we people intentionally do. Sometimes they just feel like they don't have an escape route. Correct. And so right. I definitely uh, understand that. Um, so when it comes to the book, I know you read my book. Um, how did my book impact you? What did it bring to the forefront of your mind? Uh, and, and, and just just your input on it and how it applies to our mental health and, and what we're talking about today. Well, the, the, the book, the, the piece that really, really stood out to me was in, uh, I believe it was in chapter five where you talked about mental freedom. Um, and you talked about how many people miss the opportunity to live a liberated life because of fear. And I say this to my clients, and I say this when I teach, and even sometimes when I'm preaching. I tell people, I say, listen, fear has torment. Oh, yeah. And when you are tormented, you become paralyzed. And when you're paralyzed, you remain stuck. And I tell people, you will never move forward if you allow fear to control your life. And it literally does have torment. And so I say that to say that that really stood out to me because there's a lot of people who are operating in fear. They're very fearful in different areas of their life. And they don't realize that that fear is really hindering them from moving and operating in their purpose and fulfilling their purpose in the earth and also making an impact an impact in the lives of others um and so a lot of times we don't progress because we're, we're in fear mm -hmm. you know and the, the bible says um you know that god has not given us the spirit of fear and fear has torment so i tell people one of the things you do even in counseling let's get to the root of fear let's get to the root of what you're dealing with because if you can destroy the root you can destroy the fruit and a lot of times we try to get the fruit without digging up the root so i say that a lot to my clients and, and try to encourage them and i walk them through that um, because it's very important so your that book chapter five mental freedom and, and talking about how people are not living a liberated life because of fear was very important. And I, and I and I remember talking about fear, even every time I would try to move forward, when I would move forward, right. or before I move forward, I would feel anxiety. Because anxiety or fear of the unknown or doing something different is fearful. Some people are just afraid to do something different in their life. And, it's true. and so, Really, that's even maybe the root may really be grief because if I leave it, then I'm no longer comfortable. And sometimes fear keeps us 
in the place that we were abused in, oppressed in. And so leaving takes us away from that place of comfortability, even though it's tormenting us, but we're used to it or we are comfortable in it or is we become so accustomed to, to dysfunction or that part of our life that leaving it is, is a loss. Leaving it is a loss and it grieves and us. Know, and so mm -hmm. that ahead. is so powerful because what you just said is that you mentioned grief. But what I tell some some of my clients and I share with others is this many times it's layers of different things and we have to learn to peel the onion, you know, mm -hmm. as counselors and, and things of that nature who operate in that field, whether you're, you know, psychotherapist, psychologist, uh, you know, certified license, whatever the case may be, you, we have to learn to peel the onion and get to the root of what is happening. And many times we have suppressed so much that has happened in our lives that it's not just one thing, it is multiple things. And, and, and we don't realize it because we've suppressed it so much. Yes, yes. And, and, it, and it goes from just a drop to a flood. You know, uh, right. you know, it is layers, and when we suppress it, we're, we're keeping us we're oppressing ourselves. Right. We're oppressing ourselves, and you can't Absolutely. be free, uh, not confronting those issues. Um, That's it, definitely. And we have to do it. We have to do it. Um, and I know you had mentioned by purchasing the book for some of your clients. How did they respond when they read it? Um, it, it, you know, they responded well. Um, some of them, um, they shared with me, you know, what they got from it and, you know, it allowed them to see themselves in your transparency. And that is something that I, I know that when people are dealing with certain things, just to know that someone else not only deals with it, but overcame, uh, mm -hmm. is, is very important. So for them, your transparency was very, very important to them. Um, and then also they could relate to your struggles, your struggles that you went through as far as being bullied and addiction. And then also highlighting that addiction, when we hear that, we always think drugs. So it yes. opened up a different conversation with us to yes. say, listen, it, it, you know, it's not just drugs. It's a multiple of multiple things that you can be addicted to. Yeah. Um, and so they were able to walk away with that, but you also gave them hope because you came out victorious, you came out as an overcomer. And that helped them to feel like I can move on, I can continue, um, you know, and I can continue to uh, have something to look forward to, knowing that there is hope. And, and you know, um, you know, I think that's, that's powerful because I didn't realize how powerful the book really was until it was published because it, it, realized, it makes you realize how powerful your words are. You know, right. I, even when I was going through my ordeal, I didn't go through it alone. And I right. think so many times some people feel alone while they're going through because they don't have that support. Um, what do you think, especially as from a professional standpoint, I want to hear your, your, your professional standpoint first, and then a, as a Christian, what can we do as a community from, from your profession um, to bring more awareness, to help those that are struggling with mental, mental health issues? depression, suicide, and so forth. What are, from a professional standpoint, what, what are some things we can really do that are practical? I, I would say, and again, this is, this is just me sharing uh, my, my view. Um, I would say from that standpoint, we can serve people better by being mindful of how we interact with people and how we care for people. And that is just the foundation to that. You know, we, we, we're in a society now where it's about me, me, me. Um, it's about the likes. It's about who's following me. It's about how many selfies I can take, you know. And we have to be mindful because that will come out in our interaction with people on our day-to-day -day basis. And so I think that that's the foundation there, whether it's community, whether it's church. I think that is the foundation, being mindful of how we interact and how we care for them, but also as well, um, as far as the community and the community in the church, that we have to be educated on mental health and we have to be able and willing to talk about mental health. And that is something that has, has really kind of gone, you know, been kind of swept under the rug for a long time. We have to talk about it. And it's important for, uh, and I want to add this as well, because this is something that I'm, I'm, I'm really 
I feel strongly about is that it's important for community leaders and pastors to have a good referral list. They need a good referral list, know when it's time to refer someone, right? And then have a list of psychologists and counselors, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, Christian, non-Christian, just build a good referral list to where you are comfortable making a referral and sending your member or sending someone in the community to them. Um, you know, and again, when you make that referral, you make it as if, hey, you know, I'm sending them to someone, would I want to send my family to this person? And that will really help to build a really good referral list. So I know I just kind of listed three different things there, but those things are very important uh, surrounding mental health. And you know, I, uh, I commend you for that because uh, pastor needs, pastors needs, need counseling too. I just did an interview with a pastor and he told me, man, Antoine Lash, I had to get counseling, I had to get therapy. And because he was just burnt down, sometimes these pastors are so burnt down with everybody else's drama, issues, yes. stuff. And then yes. they got to preach, and then they got to do a funeral, then they got to do a wedding. And so they got all yes. this stuff on them, and they have no one to release to. And when I was in school, the bishop used to say, every minister needs a minister. Every pastor needs yes. a pastor that you can unload yes. to. And we got leaders Absolutely. committing suicide because they're so overloaded. I was at a um, Church of God in Christ Women Convention in 2017, and they, we do workshops. And they had a part of their, it was hard, you know, it's taboo, especially amongst our, our culture. And right, they started right. talking about pastors that were depressed, having suicidal Absolutely. thoughts, Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, and don't want to live right. no more because they're <laughs> over swamped. It's they're true. Over swamped. And watch this, they're over churched, over churched, right. church too much, don't know how to take a break, take a vacation, uh, relax. The flock belong to God. You know, sometimes yes. it's. Take, take a Sabbath. Yes. You deserve a break. Yes. You know, and we do and do Absolutely. and do. And our bodies are wearing down and it's affecting our mind. And so, yeah. uh, um, you know, it, pastors need therapy too. It, it's not, a, and, then, yes. and, then, and then, you know, I keep, we keep having this conversation that so many people like to say it's taboo or it's a sign of weakness. It's not right. a sign of weakness. If I break it's my not. leg, it's not a sign of weakness it's that I'm going to the hospital. It doesn't Absolutely. make me weak. I want to be healed. So if yes. I'm broken in my mind, and my mind is broken, yes. I need somebody to help my mind. I don't need just prayer. Prayer, yes, the Word, the Holy Spirit, right. Jesus. Yes. But if there's a profession, a professional, Absolutely. you know, and I, and I had this conversation because I got to say it like this, because if I did break my leg, yes, God can heal my foot. But the, but the rational way, logical way to deal with it, God gave us resources, so he gave me a hospital. So I'm going to go to the hospital, and I still give God the glory because he made the doctor. He gave him the information Absolutely. to bring healing and deliverance. You know? Absolutely. Um, and so God Absolutely. does things um, through man and through people, and he gives us ideas, concepts, methods to help each other. Absolutely. Uh -huh. I wanted to chime in. What you said is so important, and, mm -hmm. I, and, 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 and I, I'm going to say this because it is something that um, you know, I have in my life. So I tell people all the time, you were saying how a pastor needs a pastor and things of that nature. Well, at the end of the day, a, a life coach needs a coach. And I tell, and I, I'm coaching life coaches now. So it's to the point where I tell them, I have a coach. I'm held accountable. As a counselor, I have a psychotherapist. I have a counselor in my life. You know, business consultant, I have a consultant that I can go to, that I can talk to. You know, in ministry, I have spiritual fathers and I have mentors I can go to. You need it in every area of your life if you want to be better. And a lot of times we, we don't heal. We're not able to accomplish goals, um, things of that nature, because here's the kicker. We refuse to be accountable. And when you have someone that you can go to, that you can unload. And a lot of pastors, and this is something I've realized down through the years, and I've been around a lot of them, the best of them. A lot of them are going through certain things and they don't feel comfortable sharing because they don't want their business or their information all over the city and in the street. You know, they felt they, they feel they can't trust anyone. But at the end of the day, what I tell them is you have to find an unbiased person that you can go and talk to, right? And legally, it is bound by law that they hold your information confidential. I said, so that is not an excuse not to have an outlet. The other thing, the other facet to that is this. 
is that a lot of pastors, although we help to meet the spiritual need, we still have that soul realm. We still have the mind, the will, and the emotions. And many times what people fail to realize is we're human beings as, as ministers and people who are in ministry. We have basic human needs. I want to highlight one of them. One need is to give and to receive attention. Yes. And so when you start uh, neglecting a specific need, we overcompensate in other areas. So a lot of times we don't have balance because we're trying to overcompensate for some of the basic human needs that we have in our life. Um, and we try to fill it up with going to church or staying there all night or doing whatever the case may be. You know, if you're a workaholic, throwing yourself and working all the time, you know, at the end of the day, we have basic human needs and they have to be addressed. When they are not addressed, it will manifest in other areas of your life. That is amazing. That is amazing. And it, and it makes me realize, you know, um, why God created the Sabbath. Yes. And, you know, when I, when I did a study on the Sabbath, it really, when, when you're resting, it really rejuvenates your body. Literally, the sails and everything rejuvenate yes. and, and uh, yes. strengthen. And some of us, we don't have the strength because we're just not resting. We're not taking a break. We're not taking a vacation. We're not, like right. you say, balancing because we're trying to compensate for, for things and or trying to impress people or give the illusion yes. that we're strong, but sometimes we're really broken on the inside. And sometimes it's not that I'm weak. And sometimes you got to acknowledge that you are weak. This is not until we acknowledge that we're weak that God can be strong for us and in us. You know, and, and, <laughs> Absolutely. You know, and that's a sense of pride. You know, it's, right. it's, it's not it a is. sign of weakness. When, 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 when we break down, it says I'm human. And my dad always taught this. My dad always said, your body tells on you. Yes, it does. Your body tells on you. Your body lets yes, you know what you got. Yes, your body lets you know. And so some of us, we're not, listening. we're not even listening to our bodies. And we're no. running, running, and it's breaking down. And then what we do as church folk, we'll call it the devil. And it's not the devil. It's not. It's not. <laughs> and I love what your dad said such wisdom because the other thing is this i i taught a class this past tuesday um for life 360 our small group and i began to talk about having a vision for your life and when we hear vision you know people just think oh and, and have like you know kind of like tunnel they think one thing but i begin to cover i said you need to have vision for your life in the areas of recreation and revitalization and what i told them is this you have to factor in rest you have to factor in having fun. You have to factor that into what you are doing. And I'm applying that to what we're saying as far as leaders and pastors. We have a vision for church. We have a vision to grow the church. We have a vision for our families, but yet and still we don't have a vision for rest and revitalization to be able to unplug. And, and, and when I say rest, that means actually unplugging sometimes from social media, from family, turning off your phone, you're not counseling, you're not preaching, you're not teaching. Take some time off and literally allow your mind and your body to unplug and to rejuvenate. And that within itself can bring about healing in the lives of those, not just in the pews, not just in the community, but the pastors and leaders. And when we get balance, we'll be a whole lot better. Wow, that's that's amazing, man. You you said some profound stuff. That's why I love you, man. You you always have that wisdom. You always got that wisdom. Glory man. to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely appreciate it. Uh, we have definitely come to a conclusion. But what I yes. want the people to do, I want to, if any one of you need a life coach, counseling, you want to make a turnaround, hit some goals in life, um, holistic goals, um, balance goals, need some balance, need some help. You have a life coach right here, man of God. So I love people. Um, I love God, and He's here to help. Um, Elder um, Gerald, please give them your information uh, if you do so. Awesome. Yes. So you can reach me. Um, you can go to my website at www.soundmindcc.com. Uh, again, that's www.soundmindcc.com. I am on Facebook as Elder G. Space Smith. I am on Instagram as Elder G. S. J. Um, you can find me on those uh, social media outlets. It is, I tell you, it's a privilege. And even if it's ministry, if you want to reach out for ministry, you can go to www.eldergsj.com. Amen, my brother. Amen. I appreciate you. And if anyone hasn't purchased my book, 
It is online. It's on my my uh, my website at AntoineDThurston.com and as well as Amazon. Um, and you also have a book. Tell them where they can get your books at, as well. Yes, Manager. yes. I'm sorry. Yes. So I have uh, two two books that are out: Position of Prosper, Serving in the Kingdom, that is available on Amazon. Um, I also have. Um, uh, my second book that came out, which is uh, Framing Your World Against All Odds. Um, and really what that's doing, that, that it covers so much stuff, but that's available on Amazon. It's available on Barnes & Noble. That's available in Walmart, Target. It's available, um, I believe, in Books A Million. Um, it's, it's on Amazon. So anywhere you turn, uh, you, you should be able to find that book. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us for Real Talk with Antoine D. Thurston. We got you came. Hope you were empowered, improved, and enhanced. We love you. God bless you. And see you soon. Thank you, my brother, for joining us. Thank you for having me.